I'd like to express my deep gratitude to my friend Brother Clay Williams for inviting me to be a part of this lectureship. You might have noticed that, uh, that I don't look exactly like Brother Bonner, and uh, I don't look like Brother Knight, but uh, we have the same color blood. Amen. And we have been born by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. And uh, I can't, I have to confess to you, I can't preach like them. But I can preach the same gospel. Well, right. And as long as we're preaching the same gospel, we're okay. All right. And I know that we understand we have the same enemy. And I know that we know who that enemy is. And that's, that's what all of this is about, brothers and sisters. It's about us understanding who our enemy is and what we're supposed to do with him. Over there in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 36, you'll remember that King Hezekiah and the people of God were in trouble. The king Sennacherib of that terrible people Assyria had sent uh, one of his chief rulers down and he said he brought 186,000 warriors with him and he said I'm going to crush you like the worm you are and he said you're going to have to eat and drink your own waste and uh, you can't do anything about it but you see uh, Hezekiah understood something uh, he understood he had an enemy and ladies and gentlemen, we need to know about our enemy. And I want to tell you about our enemy. First of all, I want to tell you who our enemy is not. I need to tell you this afternoon that our enemy is not the POTUS. And our enemy is not the FLOTUS. And our enemy is not even the SCOTUS. Now I can tell you one thing I know about the Supreme Court of the United States. They ain't. They ain't the Supreme Court because we serve a God who sits on a throne that is everlasting and his throne is our Supreme Court and the Apostle Paul said over in the book of the Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 that our government is in heaven and we long for that day that he will come again and he will transform this body of our lowly estate and he will conform it into the body of his glorious image and so our enemy is not uh, the Supreme Court, our enemy is not the president, our enemy is not the government, and listen, our enemy is not even the world. We understand that we are not to live in the, to be like the world, but we are to live in the world, but our enemy is not the world. Our enemy is the serpent, and he's been the same enemy since our first parents walked on the earth, and he is still our enemy. I read somewhere that he walks about on the earth like a roaring lion, Amen. seeking whom he may devour. I read in Revelation chapter 12 verses 10 and 11 that he is the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God both day and night. Our enemy is the serpent and we are to understand his ways. We are to understand his schemes and we are to defeat him not with uh, weapons made with the hands of men but we are to defeat him with spiritual weapons. We are to defeat him with the breastplate of righteousness and with the sword of the spirit, Ephesians chapter 6. And so we need to know who our enemy is and we need to be able to defeat him. And so the enemy had come down and he said, I'm going to defeat you, but Hezekiah had a plan. And Hezekiah's plan was not one that he schemed up on his own. It was not a plan that he came up with in his own mind. You know what Hezekiah did. He called the man of God. He called Isaiah. And he said, Isaiah, what are we going to do? He called a man of God. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war every day in our life. We are fighting a spiritual battle every day of our life. We are trying to defeat Satan every day of our life. And we need to know that our best uh, weapon is the Word of God. And our people come every Sunday and they sit in these pews and they're struggling with life. They're struggling with their faith, some of them. Some of them are living in sin. Some of them are doing those things that they know are not pleasing to God. And let me tell you what they need to hear. They need to hear the very same thing that Hezekiah and the people of old needed to hear. They needed to hear a word of God from a man of God. Yes, sir. Let me tell you what they don't need. They don't need another commentary on the news. They don't need to hear what uh, any of the reporters have to say about it. They don't need to hear what... Uh, what Oprah has to say. They don't need to hear what Dr. Phil has to say. They don't need to hear what any of them have to say. They need to hear what does God say. 
And they don't need to hear from the no spin zone. They need to hear from the no sin zone. Yes, sir. Right. We need to make sure that when we proclaim every time we stand before the people of God that we are proclaiming the unadulterated word of God. Yes, and let me tell you one other thing they don't need to hear. They don't need to hear the thoughts of a man who stands in a pulpit who thinks he knows more than God. Well, you know, there's not much more distasteful in life than an arrogant person. Well, the only thing that I can think of that is more distasteful than an arrogant person is an arrogant Christian. Well, and the only thing that is worse than an arrogant Christian is an arrogant preacher. Well, and we've got too many arrogant preachers in our pulpit on, because they think they know more than God. And they think that their thoughts and their ideas and their plans are more important than God. And so somebody says, how many degrees do you have, preacher? And when they ask you how many degrees you have, you tell them you've got 98.6. And when they ask you where you went to school, you tell them you went to the school of Scripture. And when they ask you where you learned what you are preaching, you tell them you learned it from God. Because our people need to hear a word from God. They don't need to hear from a man who thinks he knows more than God. I remember Brother George Bailey told me years ago, he said that our preachers are going nuts by degrees. You see, we don't need degree preachers, but we need preachers who are on fire with the Word of God. You remember in Jeremiah chapter 20 when they arrested him for preaching the Word of God and they put his hands and his feet in stocks and they put him in the middle of the courtyard and they laughed at him and they mocked him and he said, I've been made a derision all the day long. And then he said, I thought about quitting. You ever thought about quitting, preacher? Well, don't lie to me. I know every preacher of the Word of God has gone through times in his life when times are tough. And you think about it, am I fighting against the flow? Is there any way that I'm making a difference in the lives of people? If you're a preacher of the Word of God and you've been preaching more than a year and you tell me you hadn't thought about preaching, I know you'll lie about other things too. But Jeremiah said, I thought about quitting, but you remember what Jeremiah said next? I wanted to quit, but there was a fire that was burning within my bones, and I was weary with forbearance, and I could not quit. And if you're preaching for money, it'll be easy for you to quit. And if you're preaching for fame, it'll be easy for you to quit. And if you're preaching for a larger church, it'll be easy for you to quit. But if you are preaching because there is a fire that is burning within your bones, you will not be able to quit. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, you'll remember those words in Romans 1, verse 15. Paul said, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation of all who believe to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. But he said, if you'll remember in verse 15, he said, I am ready to preach the gospel. Now there are seven words in the English language in that verse. I'm ready to preach the gospel. Those seven words are translated from two Greek words. First of all, there's the Greek word euangelizestai. It comes from, it, is, it translates four words to preach the gospel. The gospel is euangelion. And Paul said, I want to be God's proclaimer of the good news. The gospel is the good news. And so what do people need? They need to hear some good news. They've heard enough bad news all week long. Amen. They need to hear some good news. They need to hear a word of grace. They need to hear a word of hope. They need to hear, most of all, a word of truth. And so Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Those three English words, I'm ready, are unfortunate translated in our Bible. Because the word that Paul used there is the word prosumon. The word prosumon, the root word of prosumon, is the word thumos. The word thumos is the word that we get our, from our English language, words like thermostat and thermometer, and it literally means, I am on fire. Well, and so Paul did not say, I am ready. He did not say, even in some of the more generous translations, I am eager. Paul said, I am on fire to proclaim on, God's good news. On, and we need people in the pulpit who are on fire if I preach like this at Louisville Sunday, they're going to kick me out of the pulpit. But I need to be on fire. And they need to see a, a man who is burning in his heart. A man who has a burning in his heart to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what they need is to hear a word from God. And they need to hear it from, from a man of God. A man who loves God with all of his heart. 
A man who loves the Word of God more than he loves money. A man who loves the church more than he loves popularity. A man who loves Jesus more than he loves fame. They need to hear a word from God. And so when I read in Matthew chapter 15, the report of our Savior's miracles had spread abroad. The Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem had made their way down to Gennesaret to confront Jesus. Imagine that. They wanted to confront him. You ever been confronted? If you've never been confronted because of preaching the message of Jesus, you might better check the message you're preaching. Because Jesus said the words that he spoke will cause people to confront you. And so they were on their way and they charged the Lord's disciples that, the, that they had neglected to keep the, listen, the traditions of the elders. And the reason is they did not ceremoniously wash their hands to purify themselves from that Gentile contamination before they ate. But Jesus focused on them, asking why they, Matthew 15, verse 3, listen, transgressed the commandment of God by their tradition. Did you know that you can transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? In these passages, we, we find highlighted a problem that has troubled man for many centuries, and it still troubles the church today. And that is, how can one properly judge between the commandment of God on one hand and that which is tradition on the other. If you keep reading in Matthew 15 verses 8 and 9, you're very familiar with verse 9 where Jesus said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Now we quote that very loudly and proudly, but do you know what verse 8 says? Verse 8 says, They honor me with their lips. Now watch it. They worship me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. Ladies and gentlemen, we better quit worshiping God from the roof of our mouths and we better start worshiping Him from the root of our hearts. You can sit in a building every Sunday and you can open your mouth when the songs are being sung and you can bow your head when the prayer is being prayed and you can listen with your ears when somebody is speaking the Word of God but your heart can be a thousand miles away. And we're ready, readily uh, critical of those who teach for doctrine the commandments of men but we need to ask ourselves every time we gather together are we worshiping God from our heart and as a preacher of the word of God I need to ask myself that every Sunday because I know that sometimes we come on Sunday and we feel like we've got a lot of responsibility you know we've got to make sure that the song leader doesn't lead too many verses so we'll have time to preach we've got to make sure that the service is organized We've got to make sure that we've got the right people to lead the prayer and that the people who are waiting on the table, and if we're not careful, sometimes our heart won't be in the worship of Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven. We better make sure that we worship God not just from the roof of our mouths, but that we worship Him from the root of our heart. And so we have to define this idea of commandment and tradition. Commandment in this context has to do with divine revelation. It is further designated as the Word of God, Matthew 15, verse 6. There are some Greek manuscripts that have, in Matthew 15, verse 6, the word law. And so commandment is equivalent to the law of God, Luke 23, verse 56. And so these terms represent an obligation, listen, an obligation that is imposed upon the people of God by God Himself. And we as human beings are amenable to every law that God has given in the New Testament. Violation of the laws of God, violation of the commandments of God constitutes sin, John said in 1 John 3 and verse 4. And so when, there, when God has given a commandment, we have to obey the commandment of God. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So there's this idea of the commandments of God, but then what about tradition? The word tradition in places like Matthew 15 and verse 3 and in the two texts that have been assigned to us this afternoon, uh, in, we, we need to understand that that word is translated from the Greek word paradosis. The word paradosis literally means uh, to give over or to give to or to give down. Sometimes there are people who talk about, well, I don't believe that you ought to be... Uh, involved in these traditional things that the church does because they're old and you know there's some people in the church today that think if something is old then it's automatically wrong well, there's some people that think that if something is new that is automatically right 
And if some new writer has written about this or come up with this idea, it must be okay. But did you know that that word paradosis in all of these passages that we've mentioned, it can mean not only to pass down, but it can mean to pass over. And so Brother Jimmy Jivitan said, rightly so, that if you do the same thing twice, it becomes a tradition. You don't have to do it a thousand times or 10,000 times. You can do it twice and it can become a tradition. Now the people who don't like tradition, who are always wanting to do something new, they're not going to like that. But it doesn't matter what we like, does it? It matters what our God likes. And so instruction that has been handed down or handed over in this expression, this idea of tradition, it can be used in a good sense, and that is when it is equivalent to divine commandment. Places like 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. In another context, it can be used in a hurtful sense. That is the human tradition, the traditions of men, common practices that, that have been embalmed over time and been, become accepted as the voice of God. And these traditions, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 4, can become burdens. They can become unnecessarily levied upon people and it can rob them of legitimate freedom of serving in Christ. Well, let's talk about spiritual discernment just a little bit. We need to reflect on some principles that, that will help us to separate law from tradition. We've got to have discernment. It's my conviction that one of the greatest absences in the body of Christ today, not only among the people in the pew, but particularly among elders and preachers, is this idea of discernment. We must be able to discern. In the 1940s, my father was a, a little boy living in Huntsville, Alabama. He told about Brother Marshall Keeble coming to Huntsville, Alabama to preach. He said that Brother Keeble, my, my grandfather was an elder in the church, and he invited Brother Keeble to come to the house and have dinner. This was in Huntsville, Alabama in the 1940s. Brother Keeble came and they visited. They prepared the meal and they got their food. And my father said, I can vividly remember, he was about 10 years old, and he said, I can vividly remember Brother Keeble. When they got the food, he took his plate and he started to go outside to eat. My grandfather said, where are you going, Brother Keeble? He said, I can't eat in this house. It'll make you look bad. I'm going to go outside and eat. My grandfather said, Brother Keeble, we're brethren. I want you to sit at my table with my family. Brother Keeble said, I know, Brother Jenkins, that it won't bother you. But you don't know what your neighbors in Huntsville, Alabama think. I'm going outside. Listen. My father said, I remember that about 10 minutes after that, we picked up the table and we all went outside and ate on the floor. Come, right. Come, Come on. When we start taking the traditions of men and turn them into scripture, when we start taking the, the traditions of men and make them into the laws of God, then we are doing great harm to the body of Jesus Christ. Come on. The law of God was made known through persons who were credentialed by miraculous signs. Hebrew law came through Moses, John 1, 17, Galatians 3, 19. The reception of the commandment was confirmed by supernatural phenomena. Things like Exodus 19, 16 and 24, 17 and subsequently countenance bore witness to the reality of a heavenly encounter. Christ's miracles that were performed and by the apostles in the first century validated the divine origin of the New Testament law that we have before us today. We don't have miracles being performed today because we have something that is better than miracles. We have the divine Word of God. The Word of God has taken the place of miracles and so we don't listen to what people have to say when they think they can perform miracles. We listen to the Word of God. Sacred law is not amenable to human alteration. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. The law of God remains inviolate. It is required for as long as God allows the world to stand that we live according to the word of God. On, Tradition, on the other hand, evolves. The word of God is not something that evolves. The word of God does not change. Since the days that Jesus walked upon the face of the earth, we are still preaching and teaching the same word. 
No wonder the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 5, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel that you've heard. And he went on to say, Though we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you than which we have preached, let him be accursed. And Paul believed that some people wouldn't get it the first time, so he said it again. Paul believed in the principle of repetition. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. And so we need to make sure that we understand that we are preaching a gospel that has not changed. It is a gospel that cannot change. Amen. Tradition, on the other hand, evolves. It is established by habit or custom. It will vary from char in character from place to place, from time to time. Tradition is not intrinsically evil because it operates in the realm of expediency and human judgment. It is, however, condemned when it is thrust into the role of the law of God and when it is bound to such. There are two really digressive directions in this law tradition controversy. First of all, there's the tendency to reduce law to the status of tradition. Then there is, on the second hand, the disposition that codifies tradition into law. You say, which one of those are wrong? And the answer is yes. They're both wrong. Well, there is a driving force behind theological modernism and liberalism in the church to trivialize the law of God. I'm telling you we're living in a day when people want to trivialize the word of God. Amen. They want to believe that their word is as important as the word of God. They want to believe that their education is as important as what the word teaches. And they have tried to remove the authority and the penalty from the word of God and it leaves behind a system of multiple choice spiritual options. The Bible does not give us multiple choice. The Bible tells us that we are to obey all of the law of God. As the brother said before, when Noah built the ark, the Bible says that Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. To liberalism, there is no inflexible right and wrong. Everything is subject to culture. Everything is subject to personal choice. Everything is subject to what I want to do and what I think is right. Liberalism asserts that Paul's teaching reflected a, a variety of traditional threats. And so there are some people that say Paul got his teaching from rabbinical Judaism. Some people say that Paul got his teaching from the Greeks' uh, Stoic moralism. I'll tell you where Paul got his teaching. He got his teaching from the Spirit of God. The Bible says the Spirit of God moved and it led those men into all truth. Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send a Spirit and he will guide you into all truth. When Paul wrote, he was not writing his own thoughts. He was not writing what he felt would work in that culture, but wouldn't work in any other culture. Amen. Paul wrote what the Spirit of God told him to write. And whenever we start fooling with the Word of God and saying, well, Paul had a, a bias against women, or Paul, uh, because he didn't understand marriage, he, he doesn't have any right to say anything about marriage, that's when we get into trouble with people saying, well, we'll just let the Supreme Court decide. I want to tell you again, brothers and sisters, the Supreme Court has already decided. And we don't have a right to change. This ideology allows a pick-and-choose mode of religion. The Brotherhood of Christ has not been affected by this mentality to some degree until recent years. But increasingly, we hear statements to this effect. Whenever you hear somebody make a statement like this, you know you're in trouble. Traditionally, in churches of Christ, we have baptized by immersion. That leaves a terrible impression. Baptism, by definition, is immersion. There is no baptism in the absence of immersion. And we do not teach this because it is our tradition. We teach it because Jesus said that we are to teach that those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Amen. Come on, preacher. Jesus didn't say the word baptism. Jesus said the word immersion. Because, you know, there were people who were living back there in the days and they were afraid of the king and the king said, I don't want you to write immersion, I want you to write baptism. And there are still people who are afraid of the king. But they're afraid of the wrong king. And so consider this statement. 
and I'm getting sick of hearing this, it is our tradition in Churches of Christ to worship with a cappella music in our worship. Our musical format, our worship to God is dictated by what is authorized in Scripture, not by common usage. Sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, in the churches of Christ, we traditionally sing, and every time a church goes down that path, you bark it down, it won't be long until they'll quit singing and they'll start playing. And so now there are people who are telling us, and every time I read this article or statement in the church bulletin, we are going to restudy the question of instrumental music. Why do we need to restudy when God has spoken? For 2,000 years, people have understood what the Word of God has said about music, and now all of a sudden we need to restudy it? And so, whenever you hear people say, we're going to restudy this, you give them a little time, and it won't be long until they'll be worshiping with instruments. And so now comes another church out of Nashville, Tennessee, in recent weeks, and they've said, well, we, we, we love our tradition of a cappella music. Brethren, if, our, if we base what we do on our tradition, we don't have a right to do it. And if, if a cappella singing, if we sing, only sing without instruments in our worship services, and if we've been wrong about that, then we need to repent. And you know what? There's some of our brethren who are trying to do that. They're trying to repent. They're saying, we've been wrong about this. Well, you can't have it both ways. It's going to either be we're going to worship God the way he says or we're going to choose to worship God the way we want. A Texas maverick wrote a few books a few years ago uh, entitled Freedom in Christ. And in one of those books, this brother argues that in the Far East, it would be just as good to use rice as bread in partaking of the Lord's Supper because in that culture, rice is the staple food. Another young preacher argued that the fruit of the vine was merely the available beverage at the Last Supper and that we have adopted that element solely out of tradition. He went so far as to suggest that Pepsi would serve equally well in our culture. This attitude dismisses the Lord's clear command in Luke 22 verse 19 when he said, Do this in remembrance of me. Another man argues that the exclusive use of male worship leaders is merely one of our traditions. Brothers and sisters, we are not to bind our traditions on the church. We are not to bind our traditions on one another. But we are to bind the inspired Word of God. In Matthew 15, Jesus said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Today in the modern world of Catholicism, according to Romanism, tradition has to assume its rightful place as a source of religious authority. Listen, tradition is not religious authority, but the Word of God is religious authority. We can have differences when it comes to the times that we're going to worship, as long as we are worshiping on the Lord's day. We can have differences of opinion on the kinds of songs that we're going to sing, as long as we are singing with our voices. We can have differences on the order of our worship as long as we are worshiping God in all of those ways that are pleasing to Him. We can't bind those things on one another. But we cannot lose where God is not loose. So, a long time ago, in the days of Hezekiah, here's what happened. Isaiah said, I want to tell you the word from God. The word from God, Hezekiah, is that everything is going to be all right. And God said, you tell Hezekiah that if I preserve this city and I preserve this nation, now listen carefully, I will do it for my name's sake. Is God going to preserve our nation? If he cho so chooses to do that, he will do it, not because I want him to do it, right. not because we need him to do it, he won't do it because that's what we think should be done. He will do it for His name's sake. Well, and everything that we do when we worship God must be done for His sake. I get so tired of people coming and saying, well, I like this kind of song. Or I like this kind of song. 
Or I like it when we make the announcements at the end of the service rather than at the beginning. And we need to say, what does it matter what we like? We're here to please Him. We're here to honor Him. We're here to glorify Him. And if God chooses to allow His church to advance, it will not be because we need bigger churches where men can be bigger preachers. It'll be for His name's sake. And I want to close today by challenging every one of you men who are preachers of the gospel of Christ to make sure that you do what you do for His name's sake. Not for your own sake, but for His name's sake. Thank you for being men and women of God. For being men who proclaim the truth of God's Word. Let's do all that we can when it comes to matters of personal opinion that we allow freedom. But when it comes to matters of what God has said, that we follow only what God has said. May God bless you richly in all that you do for Him. I forgot I was supposed to offer the invitation. I'm not used to preaching like that, brothers. But I like it. So those folks at Lewis will better watch out soon. They're going to think, what happened to our preacher? All right. Sometimes we receive, you know, invitations. I'm honored by the invitation from my friend Clay Williams to be with you. You might have been honored with invitations to special events for important people. But the greatest invitation that has ever been offered All is right. not offered to one person or two. It's offered to everybody. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God said, I'm not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. He is called the pardoning God. He is called the God who abundantly pardons. He wants everybody. Somebody was talking earlier about uh, Jonah. You know, God told Jonah, I want you to go preach to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to go. So he got on a boat and he went the opposite direction. And you know what God did next. He arranged a special three-day Mediterranean cruise for Jonah. And that whale couldn't even stomach Jonah more than three days. They spat him out on dry ground. And you know what Jonah did next? Brother Williams, Jonah went down there to his sermon files. And he pulled out his favorite sermon on judgment against Gentiles. And he went down there and preached to people. And the Bible says that they repented from the king all the way down. And over there in Jonah chapter 3, it says something about the fact that even the cattle of the field repented. Now there's just some powerful preaching right there. They all repented. Why? Oh, was it because Jonah was such a great preacher? Was it because Jonah had a great idea? They repented because God is good. And he's good to every one of us. And he wants everybody to be saved. And he wants us to be united. And we need to pray that, that we'll be more united. We need to pray that the black brothers and the white brothers will be united. Yes, sir. And that the brown brothers and the yellow brothers will be united. Yes, sir. And that the red brothers and whoever else will be united. Because when we're preaching the same gospel, we need one another. And we need to be together. And the world needs to see the church of God that is united. And when people are teaching error and false doctrine and they're turning from Scripture and they're binding their traditions on men and they're making laws out of men's traditions, we need to be united. We're living in difficult days. Our country is in perhaps more trouble than it's been in ever before. And we need to be united. So the great invitation is available for everybody. And if there's somebody in this assembly today who's not a Christian, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you'll give Him your life in repentance, if you will confess His name before those who are present and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, He'll add your name to the Lamb's Book of Life. He'll forgive you of all of your sins. And He'll put you on your road to glory. And if you're here today and you haven't been living for Him, if your life is not committed completely to you, if you need the prayers of this family of God's people, if we can help you in any way, 
We invite you to walk down these aisles as we stand together and as we sing this song.